So you know that what I do, <laughs> mathematically speaking, one of the things I like to do is I take numbers, I square them, and then I add another number to them, right? And then I do it over and over and over again and I see what happens. So I'm gonna tell you something about that today. And we're gonna start out with a really nice sort of not too tricky computationally example, which is I'm gonna take a number, I'll call that number by the variable z, and I'm gonna square it and then I'm gonna subtract one half, okay? So I take in a number, I square it, and I subtract one half, and then I repeat the process. Let's do an example, right? <laughs> so the number I wanna deal with here is zero. So if I take zero and I square it and I subtract a half, the next number I get is minus a half. If I take that number and I square it, I get one quarter. If then I subtract one half, I get minus a quarter. And then, I don't know, I get two digit numbers I don't even wanna write down. So I'm interested in understanding what happens under iteration of this process to the number zero. So if I draw the graph of this function, I know, sorry, this feels like you're taking an exam. <laughs> if I draw the graph, say y equals x squared minus one half. So when x is zero, I'm here, and it's gonna be shaped something like this. And then I'm gonna draw the line this line, if you like graphing, is the graph of the equation y equals x. Okay, you can just think of it as a line that's at 45 degrees here to the horizontal. So here's how we can visualize iterating zero under this process. So we're gonna start at zero, and we'll go down till we hit our graph. And then we're gonna turn left or right until we hit the line. Here's my line. And then we're gonna go up or down until we hit the graph. Here's my graph. And then we're gonna go repeat the process. So left or right till I hit the line, up or down, which down in this case I need to hit the graph. Left or right till I hit the line, up or down till I hit the graph. And I keep going with this process and you see that something interesting is happening, <laughs> that I'm getting closer and closer and closer. These points are sort of spiraling in to some point that lives, actually it's the point where these two things hit each other, <laughs> that lives on my graph. So this is following the, the iteration of zero under this process, because what I'm doing at each step, my sort of left and right, up and down thing, is replacing the output y as my new input x. Okay, so that's why this is a graphical representation of iterating this function. So the key feature here is that this minus one half has the property that this process sends everything close to a single point. Okay, so I've got one point here, right there. And as I do this process, I get closer and closer and closer to that point. Okay. Let's do another one. This one's gonna be tricky. If I don't draw this well, <laughs> then it's not gonna be very convincing at all. But let's try it. Instead of minus one half, we're gonna square a number and then subtract nine over 10. So this graph will look something like this. Okay, so let's do this procedure again. It's much nicer to do, I know, I'm drawing graphs, why am I doing that? It's much nicer to do this graphically because once I start actually writing down <laughs> the numbers that I get, I mean, think about what happens. So zero goes to minus nine tenths, but then I square it and then suddenly my denominator is 100 <laughs> and then I square it again and suddenly my denominator is even bigger. So these numbers get kind of bad <laughs> really quickly. So the graphical representation, believe it or not, <laughs> is actually the simpler way to look at this. So I'm gonna take my point zero and let's do exactly the same thing. So I've got zero and I'm gonna go left or right till I hit the line, up or down till I hit the graph. Left or right till I hit the line, up or down till I hit the graph. Left or right till I hit the line, up or down until I hit the graph. Actually what's going on here is we're gonna keep sort of bouncing back and forth to sort of either side of the line here. And instead of there being sort of a single point that we spiral into, what happens is that there's two points here, so sort of here and here, that each of these get closer and closer to. Okay, so two points for everything to get close to. So one point for minus one half and two points for nine over 10. Anytime you do this procedure where you take some value here, say minus one half or minus nine tenths, and you look at what happens to zero, what happens is it's possible, just like we saw in these examples, that there is some sort of finite list of numbers or of points in the, in the uh, graphical picture where everything is sort of coming in towards one of those finite list of points. 
Okay, so in minus one half, we saw the example of a single point here where everything gets close to that. In minus nine tenths, well, I, I sort of did my best, but hopefully you believe that there are two separate points here and everything kind of comes in closer and closer to those two points. It's possible to do this with more than two. So in fact, for any number, that you want, you can cook up a function like this so that you have sort of that number of points as your limit points. So if this happens, now I'm gonna get sort of my usual thing here, yay! <laughs> so if this happens for a number c, that when you do this process to zero, you get this finite list of points, then you would say that c is hyperbolic if this list is finite. Okay, that we iterate and iterate and iterate and we're getting closer and closer and closer to one of this finite collection of points on the graph. And so here's a really basic question. <laughs> um, even allowing a computer, how can I tell whether or not if you give me a number C, it's hyperbolic? Okay, now you might say, well, I've only shown you two examples and they were both hyperbolic, so maybe they're all hyperbolic. <laughs> It turns out not to be true, but what's actually happening here is notice the only way I could come up with to figure out that I had this sort of one point at the end of the process or two points at the end of the process was by iterating, right? I had to do it a bunch of times and see that things were getting close together. And the funny thing is, okay, if you know that there's only one point you might end up at or two points you might end up at, that's not hard to figure out whether or not it's true, right? You just start writing down the numbers and see if they get close to two points. <laughs> But if you don't know how many points there might be, maybe there's a thousand points that everything gets close to, how can you possibly tell <laughs> whether or not the, the process that you've got going on here, the, the parameter C that you're dealing with, is actually hyperbolic? The strange thing is we, we truly don't know how to do this. <laughs> so for example, something that we do not know at all is whether or not C equals minus three halves is hyperbolic, right? So you put in zero, you square it, and you subtract three halves and then you square that, and you subtract three halves. I don't do arithmetic in front of people. You just keep going this way. And we have no idea whether or not this picture has that feature that there's finitely many points that you end up with at the end of the day, okay, that you get closer and closer to. And so the amazing thing is that this is, um, this hyperbolic feature is actually uh, part of one of the most important unknown questions in the entire field of this iterating functions thing that we call complex dynamics. Um, and it's secretly, I've been hiding from you, <laughs> the Mandelbrot set. I'll say remember, I'll be impressed if anyone remembers. <laughs> the Mandelbrot set is a picture, it's a collection of complex numbers where c is in the Mandelbrot set if when we iterate zero under this function, z squared plus c, we don't get very large. My drawings have not improved over time. <laughs> okay, so we have this sort of complicated boundary behavior and it's this pretty picture, including the inside of these pieces. All right, so the picture I just drew you, I can actually relate back to this notion of hyperbolicity. For example, this big heart, the main cardioid of the Mandelbrot set it's called, these are precisely the values of C with the property that when you start doing this process to zero, you get a single limiting point. This disk, which is next to the main cardioid, is precisely the collection of values C, so that when you do this process iterating zero, you get two limit points. And so these pieces inside the Mandelbrot set, they come from these hyperbolic values of C, except <laughs> we don't actually know if that's true. So any drawing you can make of the Mandelbrot set, okay, the pieces that you see do indeed come from these hyperbolic maps. But it's actually an open question whether or not all of the interior pieces of the Mandelbrot set come from hyperbolic maps like this. So this is a question called density of hyperbolicity, this open conjecture. It seems so nice and easy. Up, down, left, right. <laughs> Look at what happens in the long term. But not only do we not know this very fundamental question about the Mandelbrot set, about which maps are hyperbolic or not, um, we don't even know for really basic examples, like C equals minus three halves, whether or not that single map is hyperbolic. And so this very sort of pretty geometric feature that can be described so nicely is really still a mystery. There's always new courses, quizzes, and puzzles being added to Brilliant. These case studies have caught my eye recently. How do you go viral on X? Or how do you top the charts on Spotify? 
In typical brilliant fashion, this learning material is interactive. You can play with it, tweak it, really get involved. And it's fun, it's chatty, it's written for normal people like me who just want to get smarter, who might not have all the technical know-how, but want to delve deeper into math, computer science, and science in general. If you haven't seen Brilliant yet, go check it out today. There's a free 30-day trial, and the first 200 number file viewers who go to brilliant.org slash number file can also get 20% off the top premium subscription. That's a great offer. There'll be plenty of links in all the usual places. This is fun. This is clever. Our thanks to Brilliant for supporting Numberphile. So, this is the only one that we know of, but we don't know if it's the only time it can possibly happen. So what's really going on behind the scenes here has something to do with a particular set of numbers known as the Mandelbrot set. Sometimes it's got like, how many arms is that? Seven arms? Sometimes it's got three arms, sometimes it's got something else and sometimes it's just rubbish.